This is your friendly neighborhood aviator. Hey everyone, and welcome to YFNA. Today is the first episode of possibly many, depending on how it goes. We'll see. Um, so I'm calling it AVT, which is Atheist First Theist. In this case, uh, my Christian co-host is well, my, my co-host is obviously a Christian in this scenario. So if you would like to call and get two different perspectives on any topic, yes, we're leaving it completely open. Anything you want to talk to the atheist or theist about, call the number at the bottom of the screen. We have a call screener. Let them know what you're calling about and we'll get you on the air and we can talk about it. Um, so for those who don't know, this was actually the first thing I wanted to do when I created uh, my channel. Was it, it really? Yes. I did not know that even. I had no idea. Yes. Well, so it was something I thought was like missing from the community and uh, I wanted to do it. And that's why it started with AVT and it was debates between Larry the Christian and myself. But the end goal, which I had talked to him about on numerous occasions, was having a call in show. I'm like, dude, we can offer our different perspectives. Um, and that's in fact the, I believe it was the pilot episode of my other show, The Perspective, where I had a Christian co host on. Because really? Where, yeah. Who uh, is Rick, that? Do I know them? Rick, Who is it? Rick Lockhart, the only Christian oh! who ever appeared on The Perspective. I know Rick. Well, yeah. So um, we've met on your program actually a few times. So love yeah, Rick. He's a good That's dude. Awesome. Good, very good dude. It shifted over to what I felt that show was going to be while this has still been in the back of my mind the whole time. And when I was thinking about it, I'm like, dude, Dan would be a perfect co-host for something like this. Very and, kind. And when I reached out to Dan, he was very excited to do it as well. Yeah. Yeah. I Well, and here's the thing, Ethan. I feel like my approach to really life and conversations in general is very different from what I think a lot of your audience is probably used to when it comes to engaging with Christians in this kind of a format. Cause I'm not the kind of guy that likes to just dive deep into apologetics and argue and argue and argue until we're all blue in the face. Like that's not, that's not me. I'm more chill. I'm much more can conversational. Like, I'm open to allowing other people to have their own opinions and I'm not going to shove my beliefs necessarily in your face. I'm going to be honest and give my opinion about something, but I'm not like, well, oh, you're you know, horrible person and start throwing all kinds of condemnation at people. Like that's not, that's not how I roll. So, um, well, not yeah. anymore because from what you said, you used to be a very like right leaning like one of those angry Christians, right? I was very much the asshole Christian for a very long time um, through most of, I think I'd say probably most of my life um, up until probably, I don't know, less than 10 years ago. I don't know exactly what point, but um, yeah, you and I had had conversations, I think just the two of us in the past about how I, I was definitely this this Christian that was super duper duper into debating and apologetics. And, and I had friends in high school that I would debate all day long with about the existence of God or not and science versus religion versus whatever. Um, and without getting into too much detail, um, I, there was a tragic moment that happened in my life that woke me up to realize being a dick was not the right way to follow Jesus. So... Um, <laughs> That's the, you know, the cliff notes version. Um, but yeah, so ever since then, I've kind of been like, well, I just want to have honest conversations with people, um, but gracious conversations with people who are willing to do the same. And that's really the tricky part about that. I think right. so many people go into a conversation with their guard up and they're ready to just go at it and they're ready to just come into the conversation with all of their facts and all of their arguments without ever really listening to the other person first. And they're, they're so busy trying to come up with exactly how they're going to say what they want to say to counteract what the other person is saying that they're not even paying attention to what the actual person is actually saying in that moment. And I was definitely that person for forever. So, um, so was I, uh, yeah. but, so all right, let me correct that statement. I was like, 
I wasn't really an in-your-face Christian. I was more an in-your-face Republican. But okay. first, well, to many of them, that's the same difference. Whatever, right? Like, and that's part of the problem. But yeah, when I first started uh, becoming an out atheist, Dan, you and I would have not gotten along. I'm sure I was we would not have gotten more along at all. into scoring points and trying to, you know, own theists and try and show how smart I was, even though I came to learn that I don't actually know shit. And I have <laughs> way more to learn than I actually uh, think I did. Dude, I, I I had a little bit of an ego, like, I'm an atheist. I know better. And I, I see right. this. Yeah. Very <laughs> or, or yeah, <laughs> same side for me. Like, I'm a Christian. I've been in the church my whole life. I know everything. No, right. you know, <laughs> idiot. What do you No, You don't know everything. Um, so dumb. Anyways, do you want to get to our first call? Yeah. Yeah. Let's go for it, dude. Let's have a conversation. I'm again, I, I'm not an apologist. So if people want to start debating the existence of God, I'm, I, I mean, it may or may not be very much fireworks compared to what you're used to, I guess. But anyway, well, I've actually I've never seen you push philosophical arguments for God like the Kalam. I've never once seen you been like, oh, hey, no, I'm not interested in having I got comments, you, especially with people that already have committed, you know, to the the worldview that that you don't believe in God. Then why are we going to have a conversation about all kinds of theological issues of a God that you don't actually believe in? Like, what's the. Why the hell would I want to have a conversation with you about a God you don't believe in? Let's find a middle ground and have a conversation about something we can both find some sort of a foundation on first and then build from there, you know? So yeah. anyway. Before we get to our caller real quick. Hey, uh, who uh, said that? Caitlin, you're awesome. Thank you. Um, that was very kind so of you. <laughs> she is. Caitlin is our call screener for tonight, by the way. Oh, so, that's Caitlin. nice. Thank you. Yeah, it, you know, dude, it's so cool how many people within the community are like volunteering and willing to help that's and awesome. build the channel. It's it's pretty awesome. Um, real quick from Facebook user that said, I could have told you that. Um, we won't see what your name is unless uh, there's a link in the description that's facebook.com slash StreamYard. You have to give, uh, or is it StreamYard.com Facebook? I don't that's know. What it is. Yep, StreamYard.com slash Facebook. Okay, and you just have to grant the app permissions, and then we'll see who it's coming from. But yeah. let's get our first caller on the line. We have got Jeremiah from Alabama. Jeremiah, how you doing? I'm doing good. Great. Hi. Good. Good. What did you uh, What did you want to talk to uh, today? It looks like uh, you want to talk to Dan about uh, his belief, and if you think it's a choice, is that is that correct? Uh, yes, no, uh, not necessarily his belief, but belief in general is, is belief a choice. Um, is belief a choice? Um, uh, I guess we'd have to, we'd have to define exactly what it is that we mean by the word belief first. Do you want to define that before I answer the question? Uh, sure. How about, uh, uh, a statement that an individual holds as being genuinely true? Oh, yeah, I would say that's a choice. Yeah. So actually, let, let me re reorganize that thought. A statement okay. that someone genuinely hold a statement that someone genuinely holds is being true. Sorry, the genuine is important. The, they genuinely hold as being true. They themselves personally genuinely hold it to be true. Like they accept it as truth. That individual. Yeah, I would say that's yeah. a choice. Yeah. I, I actually disagree with you on this. You one. disagree with me? Either? I do. Because, okay, think about it. Who like, would have thought? Okay. I, <laughs> go ahead. No, I, I'm, I, I'm open. Like, explain. Where, where are you going with this? Let me explain. If I, and, and it really hit me when he said the genuine part, because like okay. I could right now say, I believe in God, and I could try to tell myself that I do, but. I can't actually believe that at this point with the way my brain works. It requires evidence. So, for example, let's say I threw a baseball at your head. Mm. Do you think you could genuinely choose to believe that that baseball is not flying at your head? The baseball's flying at my head. I'm going to duck. And it's, yeah, like. Right. But so, could you yeah. choose in that? Could you choose to believe? that it is not coming at your head. I could embrace an attitude of ignorance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 
and yeah. I'll be proved wrong within a matter of seconds when it hits me in the face, right? So, uh, Jeremiah, am I going the right direction with that? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I think I have a scenario that might um, cast a little more um, light on it. Like, okay. imagine, um, Dan, imagine that we have a new device that allows us to read minds. And uh, so we ask an individual person um, if they believe in Santa Claus, the traditional Santa Claus, the fat guy that flies around in a sleigh with reindeer, delivers yeah. presents all in one night to everyone on earth. Yep. Um, we ask them if they believe, and they initially state no, because the idea is absurd. Well, if we, we look at the device that reveals that he is, in fact, telling the truth, he does not believe that santa is is real he does not right. hold that belief okay. if i held a gun to his head and demanded that if he did not change his belief and in fact believe in santa claus or i was going to kill him under the threat of death could he change his belief to genuinely believe no of course not, of course not. now but here's so let's okay. let's put let's put it on to the other side of that coin though take that same machine and put it in the eyes of my three-year-old daughter and ask her the same question. Does she genuinely believe in Santa Claus or not? Point a gun to her head or not, you're going to get the same answer and you're going to get the same result, right? So, like, I think, I, I understand, I think, I think I get where you're going with this and I don't necessarily disagree with all of the concepts. And, and all of the premise. I th do think though that, and this is maybe a place where Ethan and I differ greatly, but I genuinely believe that there are truth claims that are out there that can be made that cannot be tested or proven ever scientifically. Not every science, not every truth claim is the same as a scientific truth claim. Like, and I, Ethan, you and I have had this conversation before a uh, little bit, like, <laughs> When I tell my wife, I love you, she accepts that as true or she doesn't. And you can make all kinds of empirical evidence and all kinds of cases as to whether I do or do not. But at the end of the day, I could be doing all kinds of acts of love for altruistic reasons or not, right? So the only way that she is going to 100% accept that statement, that truth claim as being true is to just trust me, right? So, I feel like I, there are some claims absolutely that hold a hundred percent accuracy and saying, well, you, is that belief a choice or is it not a choice? Sometimes it's not. I totally agree with that. Um, but I don't know that every single truth claim can be accepted one way or the other with the kind of certainty that you're trying to get to in your question. And that's where faith comes into play. That's where trust comes into play, that sort of thing. So um, I don't know if that gave anybody any kind of thing to think about, but that would be my response. Did that uh, clarify at all, Jeremiah, or what are your thoughts? Yeah. What are your thoughts, dude? What do you think? I, I, I think you're mixing two, confusing two different concepts. Um, okay. The, the belief concept the belief concept is not about what is genuinely true. It is about what some, the, the idea that gen, someone holds to be genuinely true, whether it is true or not is independent and separate, but we're talking about belief, the, the brain state of holding a statement to be true, regardless okay. of its external truth. Okay. And so my point is if the person who had the gun to their head, cannot choose to believe in Santa, then the person holding the gun to their head is not being fair in any sense. And the person I'd, I'd, agree, the with, I'd agree with I'd agree with all of that. Yeah. So do you agree that it's not fair for God to judge me by whether I believe based on bad evidence? I, I mean, I would say this. I don't think it's the position of any Christian to necessarily cast that kind of eternal judgment on you or anybody else, because that's not their job. I'm, I, 
I'm not I'm not accusing the the Christian of making that decision since okay. the Christian can't send me to hell, right? Only only my belief or disbelief is yeah. the, the hinge that that determines whether I go to heaven or hell. I'm assuming you believe in hell and, and you're not uh Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, you're, 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 you're yep. So the so the ultimate question that you're trying to get me to answer is Oh, you're waiting for me to Yeah, I'm just I'm curious yeah, like on. just for clarifying it exactly like what um it if well I guess we can refine it a little further to if I cannot choose, genuinely choose, because right, God requires genuine belief, right? I can't just say I believe if I don't right. believe, right? God's not going to fall for a lie or me uh, right, trying to convince myself that I believe. God cares about whether I actually believe most, right? right? Yep. So if, I, if, I, if I'm not actually in control of that, but require the evidence to convince me to believe, then how can God fairly judge me? Well, okay. So that's, just that is a, that's, that's more clarifying. Thank you. Um, I, that was actually really clarifying. So my response to that would be, again, going back to the notion of um, belief, being accepting someone's statement as being true based on trust. Like that's ultimately what it comes down to. Um, whether you trust the evidence or not, whether you trust the person that is presenting the claim to you or not, it always comes down to trust. And when it comes to the question, the big question of whether or not God exists at all, I don't know that that is really a statement that can be evaluated and accepted as true on the same level as any kind of mathematical certainty or scientific belief or anything like that. I don't, I don't think that it, it's not a scientific claim. So if God's saying, Hey, I exist and you need to follow me and you need to worship me. That's not a scientific claim that you can then go, okay, well, let's, let's start rocking through the, the scientific method and start evaluating and proving that ultimately anything surrounding religion or or relationships really which when it comes to christianity a big part of that is that it's a relationship with god that all comes down to a level of trust that has to exist between two parties and so that relationship that i don't know it's again it's like with my wife i can't force her to love me but i can ask her to love me and then she says yes and then i trust her or i don't when she says she does you know see but love and I, I think i've mentioned this to you before can actually yeah. be you know investigated and verified whereas how how do we Ex break that down ethan break that down okay. for people who don't know what you mean by that because okay absolutely they might so, be out there from my understanding um you can observe emotions under and it, please correct me if i'm wrong uh under an fmri you can see the activity to light up in the brain so if we can see when the, the, I guess, love goes off in the brain, that to me is something that you can, you know, look into and verify. Is that Whereas, love though? Is that really love or is that just like, like uh -oh. infatuation or, okay, whether you know what I mean? Like, but either way, we have something we can point to. Like we have the way to verify an emotion, how do we do the same with God? You have something to point to, to give your best possible answer as to whether or not you can accept it or not. But at the end of the day, like Ethan, okay, like let's say your girlfriend says, hey, I love you, Ethan. And you go, all right, hang on, let me get you under an MRI and let's scan that and see where in your brain, like the chemistry is to evaluate how much you actually love me, right? Like, is that accepting that response? Like, is that cheapening or is that, and, and devaluing what's really trying to be addressed there? I think it kind of probably is, right? Like when we're talking about love, we're not talking about just chemistry in the brain. We're talking let's about- but that's not devaluing it. I mean, to me, all everything we feel 
is, is based on the, the chemical reactions in our brain. So why would I think there's anything more to that? It's kind of right. like people take psychedelics and they're like, oh, I, I saw God. And it's like, to me, no, that's doesn't matter what you see. Everything is still happening with, within here and it's right. not and taking at, place elsewhere. But at the end of the day, Ethan, the point I'm trying to make is when it comes to a relationship with another person, there's still a level of trust that has to be there in order for you to be able to accept it as true, unless you're going to be scanning everybody's brain chemistry every <laughs> second of the day so that you, you <laughs> know, like we'll all be walking around with like a helmet on like or no those mood rings right do you ever have one of those mood rings maybe we should have like mood sunglasses and show how much <laughs> love right, we well, have for another anyways we're I getting a little off topic with... my add is getting a little out of control but yeah dude that's one thing about this show is we both have bad adhd so... oh it's so bad yeah um, so, so i apologize already <laughs> um but i can someone can take actions like can do things for me in a way that at least gives me the impression that they love me. Mm -hmm. uh, I can actually see them do things, but with, yep. with God, it sounds like, and please, if I'm, if I'm misrepresenting you, tell me uh, I will. That I will. we just have to have faith and there's no way to verify it any other way. No, what I'm saying is that it's a relationship and that the action that was taken um, from Christianity's perspective, the ultimate action that was taken was through Jesus dying on the cross. We just celebrated Easter yesterday, right? Um, and ultimately, the whole of whether or not you believe and accept Christianity and the God of Christianity as being true or not, ultimately comes down to whether or not you trust the words of Jesus and, and you trust who Jesus is or you don't, right? Like there's there's a level of trust that, again, it has to be there if you're going to accept some claims, some truth claims as if you're going to accept it as true and you're going to believe it, it requires a level of trust. Um, and so that's, I think a lot of people, and believe me, I am one of those people would love to be able to have the ability to absolutely just hook my brain or hook a cloud up or hook us whatever to test the brain chemistry of whether or not God is and isn't there. And if he actually beloved, believe, believe, you know, whether or not he actually loves me, all of that stuff, right? Can't do that. Obviously. That would be nice if you could. So I'd be really I, awesome. I would love I that. Have right? a follow up question, but I'm gonna hold it until uh until Jeremiah is done. Jeremiah okay. is your, uh did he answer your question? I'm sure or, I was uh, rambling, so I apologize. Uh I think the the again the idea got muddled and we confused uh trust with belief because again belief as i am describing it is and i don't care if we use the word belief we can use any word we can make one up we can call it flarbins if you want <laughs> you heard it here folks i heard using, it here first <laughs> i'm using i'm using the word to describe the state of holding a statement as being true and it sounds to me yes. like when you're saying this you're saying that if i can't convince myself that it's true or if it's if i can't believe if i'm not capable of being conv truly convinced then if i trust god or jesus or whatever then i can still basically die and get into heaven which would mean that belief is not required i don't what is believe to it, believe so okay but here's yeah. the deal it's it's trust belief based that different well, yeah, I I'm sorry. I was cutting you off the delay there. I yeah, how apologize. Rude. Yeah, apologies. So for those watching, occasionally there may be some minor overlap. There is like a kind of like a second delay between the phone coming in, going through StreamYard and getting over to, to Dan and myself. So apologies. Uh, never mean to talk over anybody. No, I, I would. Yeah. Um, uh, Jeremiah, please finish I, what you're saying. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I want to say that this is awesome. The you, I respect both you guys. Uh, this conversation is really productive. So you didn't you didn't talk over me. Go ahead. Okay, okay. thank you, Jeremy. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I like I I totally accept the definition you're giving of belief completely. I just think that to some degree, there's a level of trust when we're talking about accepting a claim that someone else is making as being true, oftentimes it comes down to a level of trust and whether or not you trust 
the evidence, whether you trust the person. Um, I mean, really, it comes down to those those two things. Um, and so for Christianity, it comes down ultimately to whether or not we trust the words of Jesus and what he says in scripture or not. Um, is there enough evidence to back up that? Obviously, people have been debating that for centuries, right? Um, and I don't think we're going to solve any of those lifelong world answers here. But um, I, I genuinely feel like belief in some situations isn't necessarily a choice, but I think there are times when it absolutely is a choice that requires a level of trust on the person who's accepting that belief. And I, I mean, I, whether it's God or not, I think there are some things that require a level of trust in order to accept and believe something. But then would it really be a belief if it's based on just blind <laughs> trust or faith? Is it? Blind like, trust, point, like, or blind faith. If if, if it, this is a difficult one, um, I know, I know it is. <laughs> Did I stump you yeah. already? We're only like twenty six <laughs> minutes in, man. Come on, we got a whole rest of the show here. No. There, I, there, I, there are. I get the I get the belief component and the definition of it. I I'm not necessarily disagreeing with that, but I do believe. Oh, there's that word again. Am I am I going to contradict myself? I don't know. I hope not. But there's a level of trust ultimately. I think that has to be there for some things to be accepted as true. That is ultimately the case. Um, whether the actual belief is genuine or not, that's a whole nother conversation. And maybe we're almost having like two separate parallel things being discussed at the same time here, which might complicate it. But um, yeah, I don't know if that was clarifying. I probably confused people more than anything, but I'm a little confused. Uh, <laughs> uh, Jeremiah, right. is he uh, answering you or is he confusing you too? Sorry, I, I shouldn't pollute the well there. That's okay. If I'm confusing people, I'm totally okay with that. I'm, that's well, I do think that there is some confusion. I don't really place blame, but I would say that it sounds like you're suggesting Dan that I, I trust something that I don't believe is true. No, I'm saying I'm accepting the belief. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jeremiah. Because I'm choosing to trust the person who's telling me. The book. No, Jesus. Or, or you. As or a, my wife. Or, you, or whatever. Like, this is where, like, okay, so let's, oh. we can break it down a little bit more specifically here. Like, let's say, for example, I am telling my wife, hey, when you get home, I am going to be home. But you're not going to see me anywhere. I'm going to be hiding. I'm going to be, like, whatever the case may be. But I'm just saying, hey, when I get, when you get home, I am going to be home. But you may not see me. You may not hear me, but I am going to be home. And then she gets home and she doesn't see me and she doesn't hear me. She chooses whether or not she's going to accept my answer earlier of, yes, I am going to be home as being true or not based on her trust in me or lack thereof. Even if the evidence that she's staring at right in her face is saying, no, Dan isn't here, I could be hiding somewhere. I could be, you know, God knows where, right? And ultimately, her accepting my statement of I am going to be home is based on either trusting me when I say that or not. And whether I am or am not at home is irrelevant to the fact that she's choosing to trust me or not, right? The reality is, yes, I am home. You just can't see me. It doesn't change whether she accepts it as true or not. It doesn't matter. The reality is the reality that I was actually home. She just couldn't see me. Right. But her ability to accept that statement as true is entirely based on whether or not she is going to trust me or not. Does that make sense? But isn't. Wouldn't that be, be so I think a better analogy would be if someone else told you that you were married 
and you didn't even know you're married, but they told you to trust them that you were married. And okay. then when you got home, your wife would be home. And also your wife is omnipotent and omniscient and has been around for thousands of years and you've never seen her before, but just trust them. She's there. And Oh yeah, here's this book that says all this too. Right. I would say, I would say my response to that is if if, if my wife uh, came, if the person who's claiming to be my wife came back from the dead, then I'd be like, all right, I will do whatever the hell it is that you, (laughs) yes, I'll accept whatever you're saying because that is absolutely crazy. Right. So anyways, yeah, Ethan, you wanted to say something. Sorry, real quick. I do want to thank Ian Davenport for the super sticker. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, So, Oh, I lost my train of thought. Damn it. Um, wow. ADD it was strikes awesome again. Just said. Sorry, Jeremiah, go ahead while I try and remember what I was going to say. Um, I, I don't like the analogy of the, of love or trusting another person because it's kind of begging the question that God in fact exists because we, when you talk about trusting another person, I don't, I don't think that you would say that you have trust in someone, any, anyone else who may or may not exist, right? That you don't like the, I understand that you trust the Bible and you believe in it, but you don't, you've never met a, a person named God or Jesus, or I don't want to, I don't want to pretend that I know. I, life no, I life, get, I, but I, I have, get where you're going. You're, you're very, I appreciate the level of sensitivity by which you are trying to explain your point there. I, that I'm, I'm catching that. So I appreciate I, I that. I really don't want to offend. <laughs> um, but if you, you know, you're, you met your wife, you obviously have a piece of a document, a legal document that uh, connects you to her, uh, mm-hmm. in perpetuity unless the relationship is severed and you know she exists and other people know she exists she has parents she has uh friends she has right. pets she has uh, a, a medical history yep. there's mountains of evidence she exists mm-hmm. and the same could be said for you um mm-hmm. so maybe maybe a better analogy would be to being asked to love someone that you don't actually know exists and then listening to someone's testament that, that that this person in fact exists and loves you and you should love them back. That yeah, maybe. Dan, before you before you address that, uh yeah. Jeremiah, I have a question for you. Have you ever done any YouTube videos? No. I would He's on one now. So equipment availability. I would love to have you on an episode of Ask an Atheist. Uh this is a, a, a really good call, and I'm trying to get more like non-active atheists that would be willing. So if you're interested, I'm not putting you on the spot now, message me after the show. I would totally love to have you on. Dan, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, I well, and again, it kind of goes back to what I was saying a little bit earlier, where for Christians anyway, the the claim that is being made is by Jesus. And there is a mountain of evidence that proves that that man actually did exist in history outside of scripture even. And we can have all kinds of debates back and forth on whether or not that evidence is or is not legitimate. But I think the majority of historians at the very base acknowledge the fact that he actually existed. There's Roman evidence of the fact that he was crucified and all that sort of stuff. But I don't know that I would say the majority of historians agree that he existed. I would say there are a a lot of people like I even know uh, some uh, some atheists who will argue for the the historicity of Jesus, the Jesus of Nazareth, not in a way that he is. Obviously not the divinity of it and all of that stuff in the Bible, but just from a historical basis, uh, a a record of history, if we can accept that Caesar existed, we can accept that Jesus existed, that kind of. I don't, I don't think I'd put them on the same level. I don't think there is. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to make a claim that they're on the same level. I'm just saying that the basic acceptance of it is as a historical figure, 
there is a large portion of people out there, whether they believe in God or not, who acknowledge the fact that Jesus existed, right? So, but again, from, from the Christian perspective that, you know, atheist Christian perspective, um, that's where that's where the claim is being made is from Jesus. And so any Christian that you talk to and you ask them about their belief, that belief is always going to be rooted in whether or not they trust Jesus. They trust the claims of Jesus, not just the Bible and not just scripture, although that's a huge part of it. And a lot of those claims, obviously, we go to scripture for that. But ultimately, like Christianity, we embrace it as it being an actual relationship, which I know sounds really, really weird and odd. Like, how can you have relationship with someone that's not actually here in the room with you and you can't Agreed. talk and they come back? It sounds real weird. I know, Ethan, you and I were talking a while back about how when people would tell you, oh, God said something to me, you'd think like people actually were like hearing a weird voices mm -hmm. in their head. That's not at all. Well, maybe some of them think that, but those are the weird ones. The, but no, we're not listening to voices in our head okay. or anything like that, right? So I would say that is a pretty common thing I've heard. Now, really? I guess to make a distinction, the more... I don't want to say more knowledgeable, but Christians like you, Larry the Christian, um, a lot of the other apologists I know have never said, they, they were the ones that clarified and said, no, I've never actually heard God's voice. However, a good chunk of the Christians I do know will argue that they hear the voice of God. So in that scenario, like, I guess, how would you know whether they're hearing the voice of God or not? And what is the difference Wow, I'm about to derail this. Sorry, Jeremiah. I was going to say, Jeremiah, if, if he we'll wants back, to circle I'll back around, back but moment. yeah. Uh, Jeremiah, did you have anything else uh, before we move on? I've really enjoyed this conversation, by the way, Jeremiah. Me too. I appreciate it. I, I appreciate that you've allowed me to uh, hold your feet to the fire, so to speak, and of course. Just interact in a conversationally. Um, and while uh, I didn't convince, I don't feel like I convinced you of my point of view on belief. I, I don't see any problem with us uh, following the conversation wherever it leads. Likewise, dude. Likewise. Absolutely. Um, okay. So with that, good. I like it. Um, did you have anything else you wanted to cover, Jeremiah, before uh, we move on to the, uh, uh, if, to, before we move on? Um. I mean, I have tons of questions. Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure. Like, I'm sure. I, I like, I, how, how do you think, um, Dan, how do you think uh, it's possible for, like, well, so I guess, um, uh, so do you think that the problem of evil exists because of free will, man's free will? Do, well, I mean, that's a that's a pretty commonly held belief that a lot of Christians have that that evil exists because people choose to do evil, you know. Um, and well, spe how about specifically, like, um, do you do you subscribe to the belief that that before uh, Adam and Eve ate the fruit of the tree of knowledge and good and e of good and evil? Mm -hmm. that or that the there was no sin, or no no good and evil, or I mean no evil but only good was the world perfect and the I mean the whole Garden yeah. of Gethsemane and all of that stuff yeah but well and here's the so here's a weird theological wrinkle there um, the idea of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil means that it did in fact actually exist but were Adam and Eve not aware of it. And then thus choosing to disobey God meant that that whole can of worms opened up and realizing the difference between good and evil. Does that make sense? From a theological perspective. And again, this is kind of a weird, like, again, like earlier at the beginning when you opened up the show, I'm like, I kind of have a hard time having theological conversations with people who aren't, who don't ex aspire to the same theological beliefs that I do. I feel like it's kind of weird having those conversations sometimes because there's a level of suspension of disbelief that almost has to exist in order for you to be able to try and understand where I'm 
coming from or what I'm thinking here and how I'm trying to explain it. But um, in order for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to exist in the first place for Adam and Eve to have ever even partaken of it and sin and then come into the world, whatever you want to, however you want to phrase that, that means that good and evil technically was there. The knowledge of it, the understanding of it was there uh, before they showed up, you know, um, whether there was anyone there to act upon it or not and put it into existence, a whole other story, but that doesn't mean that possibility of it wasn't there all along. Does that answer your question at all? A little bit. Um, okay. It's uh, really just kind of a, le a lead into a, a further um, conversation because I, I mean, I am, uh, I've, I, I grew up Christian. Uh, I've read the um, King James Bible once and the NIV once. Um, okay. And uh, all the way through. I, uh, yeah. Dude, um, you are already like a notch above like 90% of the Christians that I've ever met. The fact geez. that you've read the Bible all the way through. Like, Dan, I'll tell you. you know. I, I give you props for that, dude. That's awesome. Most, a, a good chunk of the atheists I know actually have read the Bible through and through. I feel yeah? like nice. the black sheep who haven't. Because to me, a lot of them say that uh, reading the Bible is the fastest way to become an atheist. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm not going to say one way or the other on that one. I think I know a lot of Christians who would feel really differently about that. But that's an interesting, that's an interesting take on that. I've never heard that before. It's interesting. Um, all right, Jeremiah, we have time for one more question. So, it, it, so my my uh, my thoughts were that the um, that if if uh, free will was the reason that that evil has to exist, right? Because the I understand that. Uh, I know the Bible says that God actually cr created good, both good and evil. So obviously if he created it, um, uh, it had to exist. Uh, but the the question is, is I guess this, this free will exist in heaven. Yeah, it does. I like, so here's the, okay. So let me, this is a really good question, by the way, this is a, we could spend all night on this question. Um, my understanding, my theological understanding of, of defining what evil is from the Christian perspective is, is to say that if, again, looking at scripture as, as being the, the source of this definition, um, God is love, right? Like there's first all kinds of verses that are affirming that claim. Uh, and Christians accept that on on trust and faith. But if God is love um, and and he is good, then evil, it best way to describe it that I've heard explained, and some of the people watching have probably heard this already and they know where I'm going with it, but it's not unlike a descriptor that is used to describe the absence of something, if that makes sense. Like from a scientific perspective, if you want to create an analogy if we're going to say wow it's really cold outside the word cold well yes that's a word we use to describe something very real and very tangible right but cold itself isn't something that's transferred it's energy it's heat right it's a word that we use to describe the absence of energy the absence of heat right darkness is a real thing as well right but it's not like darkness is shooting out anywhere, right? Darkness is a word we use to describe the absence of light, the absence of light, light waves and, you know, all of that sort of thing. So when we're talking about evil, from my perspective, from the Christian perspective, from the theological perspective, when we're trying to define and understand evil, um, we, ex we embrace the concept of evil as essentially the absence of God in that situation, because we accept that God is love, that that Jesus demonstrated the ultimate act of love and being willing to die 
for us or worth dying for, right? And so if we're going to start talking about what is the existence of evil, that is the existence of the absence of God, the disobedience or the distance from God, if that makes sense. Th this is actually a little difficult because I have so many objections, but I, I, I'm I'll, sure you do. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you do. I'm like, how much do I like? How much do we go at it? So, uh, right, <laughs> uh, Jeremiah, I'll give you the the closing thought before. Uh, yeah, go for move it. On to our next caller. I definitely cannot wrap my brain around anyone holding a god to be all things good or or all love. And uh, if that God actually created evil. And I, I would um, say I, I, maybe I, I, the maybe the definition or understanding of God creating evil um, is just something that I don't I don't agree to that theology. So I don't know if that's maybe a different I don't know where where that theology came from, but I, I'm I look at it as, OK, if God is love, then the absence of God is evil so did he create that by making it so that there are areas where he doesn't exist i mean maybe you could say that but then that comes into the whole free will thing and all of that like people have a choice whether or not they're gonna do good or do evil right and i would argue that doing good is following jesus like following jesus in whatever direction you should go that would be doing good and the opposite of that would be doing evil but anyway. All right. Before I, I push back, uh, I'm Jen, sure. I, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to call us. This was uh, really enjoyable. So thank you. Yeah, it was. And very, this was, this was very, very outstanding. I greatly appreciate it. Thanks again. And I hope, uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. You guys. Too. Sweet. That's awesome. That was I'm awesome. Sure Maybe soon. even have him on the show on your, uh, on your other program. That would be Oh awesome. yeah. If he reaches out and is interested, I'll totally have more. Hey, hey maybe we can have a part two if he comes on and then I can, uh, do, you know, it's ask, a you know, get to know an atheist and ask him questions. So maybe then we can have like a part two. That would... I have so many show ideas. I'm like, so I already have obviously a full time job. <laughs> but for those who don't know, I've, basically turn YouTube into a full-time thing. Like I am endlessly working on new concepts and new ideas. And when, or if there is a point where I'm lucky enough to make this my full-time job, I assure you, you're going to see way more than what I'm already doing because it's just like this, my ADHD creativity is so focused on this channel and all the ideas and community building I want to do. And wanting to put together a 24 hour skeptic network, like especially with news, man, news media today is garbage. Imagine if we had a skeptic news outlet that presented the information honestly and didn't add all the bullshit to it. Like that's to me what we need. Um, so uh, a few things uh, before we get to our, our, our next caller. Yeah. If, if, if it's just coming down to like faith and trust, why don't you trust Muhammad? Like, why did you land on the Christian God instead of Allah? That's a good question. Um, and especially since yesterday was Easter, I think the ultimate point is because Muhammad died and stayed dead. That's, you can disagree with me on the concept of Jesus raising from the dead. I'm sure most of the people in your audience think I'm batshit crazy for believing that. And I get it. I get it. But, um, yeah. I mean, when it comes to all the other religions that are out there, I, I, I okay. We're, that, that's a pretty big one. Have you ever seen anybody, and we're taking Jesus out of this, that has successfully come back from the dead after legitimately dying? And I'm, I'm not talking mm. about like they thought the person was dead or died. No, no, no. Or I'm like they were declared dead, dead but they were an ice cube for forever and then they woke. No, yeah, no. no okay. Of course not. So of course not. Ethan. Why are you so sure that something that happened 2,000 years ago when people are far more gullible back, back then, mm -hmm. um, why are you so sure Jesus indeed resurrected when we have no example of this ever happening? And we do know that people historically were far more gullible and likely to believe things like that. I no, I they were far more gullible. But the one thing that I think 
as as far as like human character is concerned, I don't know that it, it is within the human race to be willing to f- die the gruesome deaths that most of the disciples died for something they knew was a lie. Not a single one of them. Does what that make sense? They- but like, what if you thought it was true? Like to give you an example, was it the the uh, I I don't want to call it the Ku- the Kool Aid thing where everybody drank yeah, that- J- Jonestown, right? Is that what you're talking about? They're all drinking right. the Kool Aid, and the, that's where the whole phrase right. comes from. So totally, yeah. Example of people willing to to yep. possibly die. Absolutely, for absolutely. So again, uh, uh, isn't it reasonable to think if they thought this was true, they would have died for it too, whether it was true or not? Yeah, I mean, I guess that is reasonable to believe. But then, where what what's the explanation for all of the stuff that, like, give me I'm, an example. I'm, what's the there? Explanation? There are so many factors in play, and so many things surrounding the entire Easter story and the resurrection that go far beyond just like a big hoax. And I'm curious, like, what is the, Well, I'm not saying it's a hoax. I'm just saying, well, if it wasn't what actually happened and then somebody was behind it and staging it and it was a hoax, right? Like either it did happen or it was a hoax really. Well, not necessarily. The problem is people, uh, stories change over time. Things people exaggerate, you know, one time your buddy ate, you know, eight wings. Then the next time mm-hmm. he ate 20 wings. Then before you yeah. know it, he all of a sudden finished 75 wings in a single right. scene. People exaggerate. And, and if me, his buddy was there for the whole thing and saw it myself, and I knew that my buddy was exaggerating and full of shit, I would have called him on it right then and there in front of everybody. Right. So when the gospels were written, when the new Testament specifically was written, it was written and distributed when people who were there to actually witness all of this for themselves were still alive and still around. And on top of that, all of the religious leaders of the day who wanted Jesus to be dead and to stay dead and to make sure that there was no confusion over the fact that, nope, this dude is dead and that is it. They went above and beyond to make sure that it was going to stay that way. And if anybody was going to be keeping a close eye on the situation to make sure that that rumor never spread, it was them. So if they themselves didn't want to see it happen and the Roman, the Roman guards and empire, like they didn't want to see it happen. And they never, there's no historical record of any of them coming out and saying, nah, no, he is dead because X, Y, Z, and they come right out and show everybody, right? There are multiple, multiple parties that would have come out immediately, immediately to say, nope, that's not what's going on. Right. But that's the thing though, is it's not like this isn't back then wasn't like it is today where someone could just go on the news, say, Hey, that's bullshit. And all of a sudden a bunch of people hear it. These are, are, you know, uh, there, there's no direct line, like immediate line of communication. So if someone could say it's bullshit. It doesn't mean it's going to get corrected. And if what Wade says is true and it was written 30 plus years later, isn't it reasonable to, to believe that these stories could have been either, if not fabricated, exaggerated? Exaggerated, sure. But from the very get-go at the beginning of the story, the whole foundation for the religion itself was off of the fact that Jesus didn't stay dead. So I don't know that that was ever an exaggeration of something that may have happened. Like that either did happen or it didn't. And I don't know that there's any account of it being exaggerated, which means that there's historical record and evidence of the non-exaggerated account ever being written down anywhere or distributed or told anywhere. Like that stuff isn't there either. Like the account of Jesus raising from the dead from all the manuscripts and everything like 30 years, like, like when Wilson was saying, like, that's, that's the story. That's the account. See, I still so, know, I can't wrap my mind. And uh, after this, I want to get to the caller. Otherwise, again, yeah. you would probably go back and forth all day, but I'm sure we um, would. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't find it convincing that somebody 2000 years ago, not only died, but 
was resurrected. Like, for mm. example, think about this. People still think Elvis is alive. People are spotting him today. But we we nobody takes that seriously. It's so easily, oh, El, come on, it's dismissed. But then when it comes over to here to Jesus, it's like, well, what, what do you mean you don't believe he rose from the dead? I don't find it convincing, but let's, uh, let's, no, go hey, like, I'm not here to try and necessarily push it on you to say, no, Ethan, this is a competition and I'm right, dude. You have to accept what I have to say. Like, that's oh, not what this is about, right? So, um, I, I totally get the comparisons that you're trying to make. My ultimate point here is I, I make the claim that I believe God exists and I've got my own reasons for that. And maybe we can do another episode sometime and unpack some of that when we have more time. Um, well, there's two, two but then, Oh, sorry, please. Well then comparing all of those religions that are out there, if I do accept at, if I accept that one first claim that I believe there's a very good possibility that God does exist, then you start looking at all the other religions that are out there. Um, and, I, I accept Jesus. Like that's what it comes down to. It. So there are two things I want to get to later. Bob, yeah. we do have a caller. Okay. Um, oh man, one of our callers dropped. Please call back, particularly if you're a Christian or a theist and you want to challenge the atheist. I shouldn't say challenge. If you want a conversation with the atheist, give us a call. Uh, I do want to talk later about determinism and when you had said, uh, like God being a loving God, but. In the meantime, we're going to get right. Matthew. Matthew wants to talk about, so how does Dan reconcile the differences between different Christian doctrines? Uh, Matthew, you're on with Dan and Ethan. How are you? Hi, Ethan. Hi, Dan. Hey. Good to, good to talk to you again. Sorry, nice I, I'm talking to you. Matthew's I, I, called my show a few times. So Awesome. What did you want to talk about today, Matthew? Um, so, full disclosure, I come from a Christian background. Uh, I used to be a Christian. And whenever this question was asked to me, I never really thought about it. So I kind of wanted to get Dan's perspective. Now, Dan, um, different sects of Christianity believe different things about, you know, how, how one is saved or what is right and what is wrong, right? I, I mean, I would say maybe the right and wrong component, yeah, but majority of Christianity all agree on the the whole, like, how one is saved, like the salvation component. If you're not on the same page with that, well, then I don't know that you would necessarily be able to define it as Christianity. But anyways, go, go ahead with your question. Go ahead with your question. Uh, yeah, it's kind of like, uh, so uh, when I look at just Christians within my family, my brother and my parents, right? They believe very different things. My brother being from a younger generation who's more liberal, he's still a Christian. He believes that, you know, um, homosexuality, for example, is acceptable. It is not conflicting with uh, Christian values. But if I look at my parents who are a little bit more conservative, uh, who are from an older generation, they're like, well, I don't know. The Bible says that's wrong. So how do you determine between these two things what is right and what is wrong per your theology? Great question. That is a really good question, dude. I like that question. Um, ultimately, I think the whole different denominations, different set of beliefs, different like all the very, very minute details of specifically when it comes to this, like sin issues. Like some Christians make certain issues significantly bigger than others. Like you mentioned, um, you know, LGBTQ plus community and like that whole issue. Or, I mean, I can't tell you how many Christians I know who have no problem having a drink whatsoever and having a cigar and sitting back and talking theology and about God. Right. And then yet other there are other belief, other sections of Christianity who absolutely think those people are going to hell and and they aren't really Christians because they're partaking in an alcoholic beverage or something like that, right? Um, 
right? I think I think those issues oftentimes end up illuminating the fact to the rest of the world that not every Christianity is not every sect of Christianity and denomination. And I even go so far as to say no section of Christianity has it all 100% detailed figured out. And anyone who says that they do is full of shit and lying to your face. So, but shouldn't it be like more consistent? Like the fact that it's all these people get these very, or sorry, real quick, Oz, uh, thank you so much for the super chat. Ah, that's way to I'm go. A Christian atheist. Where's the show for that? Uh, <laughs> um, okay. So <laughs> add that one to the queue, Ethan. You got so many other ideas in there. We'll just keep, <laughs> keep rolling. But the fact that we can't <laughs> seem to get consistent answers from Christianity, mm -hmm. shouldn't that demonstrate the fact that it's not very reliable? Well, or is it? Or is it demonstrating? No, go ahead. Go ahead, bud. You bet. Absolutely, Matthew. Go ahead. I think it's less a pro, like even a step away from us, Ethan, as atheists, just a step for Christians. If you believe that sin leads to hell, then isn't it important to know what is and what isn't sin? So just within your own, own belief system, don't you think that's kind of important I, that's a that's an excellent question too dude um i think that's where again a lot a large part of the differences on those issues come into play when you start talking about the reason why jesus came in the first place right like which was to take the penalty for sin right if we're talking theologically we're talking jesus died on the cross we just celebrated easter the whole reason why he died was so that none of us would have to pay the penalty of our own sin because he took it upon himself, right? So that includes stuff that we know to be sinful and we do it anyway. And it also includes the stuff that we think isn't sinful. Maybe it turns out it is, according to God, who's the ultimate one who's deciding all of that, right? And, you know, it, it ultimately it's on him, which is where the whole Jesus thing comes into play. Like if I'm wrong on a sin issue, and I, again, this is a conversation, I keep coming around to this, like we're having conversations about issues with sin and with people that don't even accept the concept of sin. So I find that hilarious. But um, I, I think it's important to recognize that for a Christian, the issue of sin is something that is covered through Jesus on the cross. And a big part of that relationship and why they love Jesus so much is that the things that are sinful that we know are and we know we've messed up because everybody hopefully are, is, is willing to acknowledge the fact that we're not perfect. Um, I sure so. I, I know I'm not, right? Um, and then the other areas where I know I've screwed up and I'm not even aware of it yet. And, and I'm still growing in my own character and my own ability to be the person that I feel God's leading me to be to show grace to people. Um, Jesus is there for those moments when I'm at my worst and I'm not even accepting the fact that I am at my worst. Does that make um, sense? Real, let me real quick. One second, Matthew. I would Go like ahead. to thank godless uh, blessings. Uh, they said, nah, I'm an agnostic gay Christian atheist. Thank you for the super chat. Also, uh, for those watching at the end of this show, if you could send me a message on Facebook, let me know what you thought. If you'd like to see something like this again, or if you thought this was just a, a, a one-off show, I could really use some feedback on, on what the community thinks in this. Uh, Matthew, mm -hmm. go ahead. So you said something very interesting just now, Dan. You said yeah. that Jesus forgives things that one, you know are sins, and two, things that you may think are not sins, but are actually sins. So say, for example, and I'm taking this to a logical absurdity right uh okay. let's say there's a person who thinks who thinks that killing people of a particular race is justified uh does that count as a sin if he doesn't repent it it's definitely a sin to commit murder yeah for sure <laughs> so re so repentance is necessary for forgiveness uh, is that right repentance is ex so now we're getting deep into theology, dude. Wow. Nice. I, I um, a 
lot. I'm a former Christian. So. Yep. No, that's awesome, dude. Um, you're bringing the right questions. I love this. Um, so this is actually something that is debated within Christianity, believe it or not, on how much repentance is required after the initial acceptance of Jesus um, and the sacrifice that he made and making him Lord of your life. Like there's a concept um, within Christianity that's called sanctification. That's the process of becoming made into the person that God has called you to be. Um, and so there, within Christianity, there is different schools of thought on, do, do you have to repent from every sin that you've ever committed every single time in order for you to actually be forgiven or is Jesus sacrifice that he made and his extension of grace to you blanketing over all of them for your entire life and accepting forgiveness is a continual lifelong commitment, but it's not like a check the box here. Oh, I, you know, like Catholicism is a big one. Like they're, they're definitely in the, no, you committed this sin. So now you need to say this many Hail Marys. You got to do this many Our Fathers. You got the whole deal, right? Not every section of Christianity is necessarily like that. Um, but repentance at its core um, is definitely necessary at some point. And a life of repentance, for sure, uh, of acknowledging the fact that you need Jesus um, to cover that to cover those sins that you know and the ones that you don't um, and to have a spirit of humility and, and repentance about them. Yes, absolutely. The repentance is, is definitely key uh, in accepting the sacrifice that Jesus has made. That was a really deep theological question, but I hope I didn't bore anybody to death with my answer. So many questions. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, and, and, and anyone watching, if there are any theists or Christian watchers, uh, please uh, give me a call. Ch challenge, challenge me, because uh, right now Dan's been getting all the questions. I'm getting uh, baptism under fire, apparently. Right? This is a big uh, one. <laughs> by the way, I, uh, I, I don't, I don't mean, I don't mean to put you under pressure. That's I'm okay. Not, no, I don't, I don't. I'm not under pressure. I showed up to get asked questions, so there's. <laughs> you're not uh, fun to be under pressure, dude. I do just want to read Oz's super chat real quick. Great job, Ethan and Dan. This is how we normalize atheism. Got to bounce. Dude, thank you so much for the second super chat. That's awesome. And how we normalize normal people as being Christians. Can we no, also throw we that in there? No, we don't need to normalize Christianity. We need no. to normalize atheism. Normalize normal Christians that aren't psycho Republican, you know, oh. <laughs> alt-right crazies. Can we norm Can we try and normalize that? People, that's, those people who aren't in that category, is that okay? That's one thing I love about you. So for those who don't know, he has a podcast called Dear Christians Podcast, where it's basically telling all these Christians what they're doing wrong, which I love because to me- Kind of tends to be that way. I don't necessarily go into it strictly going, hey, idiot, get your act together. Yeah. But it kind of comes across like that sometimes. <laughs> and I, you know- well, it's, it's I, yeah. refreshing because if I'm being blunt, one of my biggest frustrations with with Christians in general is their unwillingness to call out bad behavior and this continual behind closed doors mentality. Like, oh, we can't talk. I'll, I'll deal with this privately. No, 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 no. This is the crap that needs to be just, stopped. Like just this past week over Easter weekend, all of this crap going on about uh what's that guy? Matt Gates? Is that the guy's name? Harrow. Oh, anyway. Who? You're still you're still here, but I'm sorry. We're like on a rabbit trail of rambling here, and it's totally awful. Yeah, I was just but, I wanted to point out that I'm glad you're willing to call out other Christians. And I yeah. wish more Christians would get in the habit of doing that because like, I would agree. I don't give a shit if you're an atheist, a Christian, a Muslim. If you're an asshole, I'm, I'm, I will. If you're doing something that harms people, I have no problem publicly calling that out. I, I, I will not do this bro, like bro code behind closed doors bullshit. I hate it. Like that just drives me nuts. And that is a problem with, I guess I shouldn't say just Christians, society in general, because it happens with police officers. It happens with frat boys. They got to protect their boys. Fuck that shit, man. When and that, that leads me into a plug for one of the episodes coming up. Um, 
and I don't know if it'll be this month, there might be next month, but we're going to be talking about the, the darker side and the dangerous side of purity culture that existed oh. for a lot of people in the 90s yes. um, and how it's absolutely wrecking a lot of um, Gen Z, Gen X and millennials ability to have healthy sex life and all of that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, that, there's cool. a lot of stuff to cover there. Um, I would love for Catholic traditionalists to call in. Now, are you familiar with presuppositional apologetics? Yes, I am. So, Did the fake Christian on your show Joe, vote for Joe Biden? So I, oh, I don't this want is to misrepresent Catholic traditionalist. Um, and if I do, please feel free to call the show and correct me. But he is um, one of those far right leaning, aggressive presuppositionalist Christians. That's not as pleasant as you are. So he finds you to apparently be a fake Christian. Okay. We'll leave that I, to Jesus. So I guess. I hope, we, I hope that one. Uh, but Matthew, I'll, I'll, I'll let you continue. Right. Um, well, um, let me, I, I don't know if we want to keep going down this uh, line of questioning or if you want me to switch to something that's a little bit less of a challenge. And a little more of a hey, you, you, you could ask me about Marvel versus DC if you wanted, man. Yeah, I really yeah. don't care. That's so, so open ended. You can let literally anything, whatever you want to ask. Yeah. So for those watching, if you can literally call, we will give you the atheist and Christian perspective on anything: politics, religion, current affairs, music, like whatever you want to talk about. Give us a call. It is not limited to just the a religious discussion around the Bible and Jesus. We are open to almost anything. Um, so go ahead, Matthew. Um, well, okay. Well then, how? Uh, let me let me go in uh, slightly less, I don't wanna make you feel pressured then. Uh, how, when when Ethan mentioned that, that you call out um, Christian behavior or Christian doctrine very often, how do you deal with people like say Catholic traditionalists? How do you kind of like, um, I don't mean to disband you. I'm so sorry. Uh, but like, how do you, I'm not offended. Reg you... Whatever, dude, it's, I, I don't get offended easily. So you're, you're good. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's Dan's pretty laid back, Matthew. So you should be good for the most part. <laughs> That's the whole reason he trusted to have me on this yeah. program. <laughs> I'm pretty chill. So when, it's all good. How do you get people from point A to point B when they dismiss your entire position as you quote unquote not being a true Christian? Um, well, I would say that that dude, you're rocking like some amazing questions. We need to have I understand why you have him call in so much, Ethan. He's on he's got awesome questions. Um well again. I'm called to follow Jesus and I'm going to follow his example. And when he went to his own home group of people and spoke the truth and love to them, and they basically said, screw you. Uh, he dusted the dirt off of his feet and said, all right, moved on and went somewhere else to talk with people who are willing to talk with him. Um, there's, there's not a lot of point in having honest and authentic, meaningful discussions with people um, who are just there to try and win an argument. Uh, I, again, I was that kind of person a long time ago. Um, I don't think I changed or impacted the life of very many people at all. Uh, I can guarantee you the people in my life who I knew were not Christians definitely weren't seeing and experiencing the love and grace of Jesus in their life personally through me at that time. Um, because I, I was more interested in winning an argument and trying to prove them wrong. I'm sorry, but I don't, with all due respect to the, what was the guy's name? Catholic traditionalist or whatever. I, yeah. I don't see Jesus spending a whole lot of time trying to prove and argue and berate over and over and over and over and over with people um, that he's right about something. Um, that's not what he did. That's not what he did. Uh, he went, he let people hang out with him. The rich young ruler is a great example of this. 
the rich young ruler, for those of you who are not familiar, is an, exam is, is an example in scripture where this guy is young, he's wealthy, he knows scripture, um, and he's apparently been hanging out with Jesus and his crew for quite a while. Um, and he gets to a point where he realizes there's something else that he's missing, uh, that there's more to this whole story of following Jesus um, than, than what he's grasped thus far. And so he has a conversation with Jesus and Jesus response is, okay, well, you know, scripture, great. Now go sell everything that you have and then come follow me. And the reason why he called him out on that was because he knew that in his life, the one thing that was holding him back from being the full expression of the person that he could be is to step into the realm of being generous and giving away everything he has and, and demonstrating that so that all of his stuff wasn't what defined him and gave him his value and his worth because that stuff can be gone in an instant. Right. Um, that guy thought he was in the inner circle and thought he was cool. And then he asked Jesus a question and Jesus gave him a straight answer. He didn't sit there and debate with him relentlessly over and over and over and over and over or try and beat him over the head and say, you're a sinner. You're a sinner. You're a terrible person. You're going to hell. You've got to get rid of all this stuff. No, he just said, okay, sell everything you have and come follow me. If you want to, if you want to see more, if you want to grow more in what we're doing here. Uh, and he left. Okay. He, he chose not to. Jesus didn't go chasing after him. Jesus wasn't offended by the fact that he left either, right? He's just like, okay, moving on. I'm going to keep keep sharing what I'm sharing, keep blessing people that are around me, keep preaching the truth. And if people listen, they do. If they want to keep talking with me, great. If they don't, okay. Um, and that's the approach that I try to take. So I'm not like, I don't know. If that makes me a fake Christian, then... I guess that Jesus, uh, thank, thankfully, my name is Dan, uh, <laughs> Daniel, the meaning of which is God is my judge. That is literally the definition or the name behind my, the meaning behind my name is God is my judge. And uh, I've hung on to that for a lot of this. So that was a really long answer, Matthew, for a very, very powerfully important question. <laughs> I um, hope it was meaningful enough for you, but I, I hope it was uh, Matthew. So we got a couple more callers. I do want to give you one follow up, but I also want to thank Nathaniel Walters for the uh, five dollar super chat. I actually prefer the agnostic perspective. Ooh, that's almost he had a little wink in there. It almost sounded like he was a little dig there at you. Ethan. He's also, uh, he was one of the ones I was thinking of earlier when I was talking about, uh, you know, people who argue for the uh, historicity of Jesus being a real person. And he's, okay. he's atheist. sorry, I believe he's a agnostic atheist, but I he's not here. So I don't want to speak from him just from my understanding. Mm -hmm. He is. And uh, yeah. Um, yeah. He argues pretty hard in favor of Jesus of Nazareth being a, a real person. But Matthew, cool. uh, go ahead. Okay, um, last question, really quick, just multiple choice. Yes. Uh, the choices are yes, no, I don't know, right? Does Jesus want people to get vaccinated? Does, does, Jesus, does Jesus want people to get, I missed the last part of that, what was that? Get vaccinated. Want people. Does Jesus want people to get vaccinated? Hell yes. yeah, he does. Oh, okay. Great. I mean, at least, I, okay, so here we go. I am not about to speak for Jesus. So that answer I just gave, hell yeah, he does. Let me retract that. I'm not going to try and put words into Jesus' mouth. But it's definitely the uh, wisest you, choice you, that you, you could possibly do. Does, right? Yeah. Should get vaccinated. Yeah. Of course you should. What's so right? what? for, for the people <laughs> currently arguing against the vaccinations, particularly from a religious perspective you would i could say vehemently disagree with them and advise they do get the covid vaccine i would argue okay let's go read through proverbs a little bit and talk about how wisdom is crying out in the streets and you're going to pay the penalty of being stupid and not listening to the voice of sound word and adhering to wisdom that god has provided to us modern medicine is absolutely a gift of god it is not something that is in contradiction to him so i there are these people who have this idea that, oh, well, if I'm going to take the vaccine, then that means somehow 
I'm not trusting in Jesus to be my savior or to keep me safe or to keep me healed or, oh, if it's my time to go, then it's my time to go and I'm not getting a vaccine. Like from a political perspective, I understand the argument that people should have a choice over it, whether you are going to get it or not. I am definitely in the more, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The libertarian side of that, where it's like, okay, people should have a choice. We're not going to allow the government to force it on you, but is a really dumb idea if you choose not to. And the whole argument of, well, I'm going to just let Jesus decide, okay, every time you get in your car, then you're just not wearing your seatbelt. Is that what we're deciding now? Like just whatever, who cares? Whatever happens, happens, right? No, we get in the car and we wear our seatbelt. Why? Is it because we're not trusting in Jesus to keep us safe if we get in a car accident? No, it's because it's just wisdom. It's freaking wisdom to wear your seatbelt when you're driving your car. It is wisdom to wear a helmet when you're riding a motorcycle, right? I'm sorry, but if I was a teenager and I was getting in my car and I told my mom, screw this whole seatbelt thing. I don't like it. It's uncomfortable. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to drive however the hell fast I want to because Jesus got me, right? My mom would take my keys away from me and not allow me to get into the car ever. And my mom is an amazing woman of God. Like she's, yeah. So, yeah, the uh, the whole like get vaccinated, don't get vaccinated, wear a seatbelt, don't wear a seatbelt. Like, and here's, okay, I'm getting on my soapbox, Ethan. You brought the whole. Make it quick though, because we do I'm going to try and make it really quick. I know we got another call, but. This stuff coming, this opposition coming from Christians who are constantly harping on the pro-life phrase. If you want to be pro-life, then get a vaccine. If you want to be pro-life, wear a freaking mask. Like it is not just about you. It is also about the people around you that God has placed within your life. You're doing it for them as well. Like let's really embrace that term pro-life and demonstrate it by really being pro-life in every aspect of your life. Anyway. Okay. I'm off my soapbox. Okay. okay. I'm totally taking some of these clips though and post and, and cutting them and posting them because and I'll get ready for the hate mail. Uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> dear Christians podcast.com. Check it out. Go ahead and send it there. Um, awesome. Matthew. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> yes. Thank you, today. Matthew. Thank you very much. folks. Thank you. I will talk to you later. Bye. -bye. Right. Sounds good. Awesome. Dude, that's a great I, I guest, really, dude. Like, Love that. I don't want to end these calls. I want them to keep going. But I know. Uh, you know we've only, had, we we only had two. I know. And we're almost an hour and a half into the show, and we've only talked to two people. I know. I hope I, I hope you're not uh, uh like on a quick rush to leave because we've still got more callers. How many do you how many do you have lined up? I wasn't planning on going like all night here. No, but... no, not all night. I should have said that's that. what she said. Okay. Um <laughs> Oh, my bad. Can a Christian make a that's what she said joke? Can they that's do that? Can I guess. They? Yeah. I'll take it up with Jesus, I guess, when I die. Uh, so, um, um, it was a question. Uh, I can't find it to put it on the screen. Oh, one thing I did want to say is you, you, uh, there's so many things I want to bring up. Okay. <laughs> Real quick. Uh, crap. We should be taking go? notes, dude. You should be taking well, notes. Yes, and keep it for part two. There's so many things. But, uh, what is your opinion on those? The whole shoe situation, uh, little Nasa shoes, without going too. Have you not heard it? Shoe situation, dude. I don't it's know all, if I know that, man. So, um, uh, uh, little Nas made these. Uh, hang on, I, I, I don't want to. You'll have to. You'll have to catch me up. My okay. So my parents were in town this past weekend for Easter, so I was not on the news or cert, like any of that stuff very much, and our internet was out up until about. 30 minutes before the show started because we had painters in today and they were like, so we had to disconnect a bunch of stuff. So I have been very much out of the loop on a lot of what's going okay, on. So, so Lil Nas released mm. the Satan shoes basically as a way to push back on, on Christians and how judgmental they can be from, from, as I understand it, anyone watching, if I'm incorrect, please feel free to correct me. He put a pentagram and allegedly human blood in these shoes human so, blood 
Yes. So now Who's signing up to give out their blood to put on a shoe. I don't know, but Christians are in an uproar. And over we're this nervous time. about getting like microchips through a vaccine, but we're giving out blood for shoes. Like what? The... <laughs> I, Anyways, I'll follow up with you when I've read more, uh, and I can. Yeah, but accurate... right off the bat, though, my initial impression is: who gives a shit? I'm sorry, I really just don't. Some dude wants to make a shoe to try and agitate Christians. The Christians get agitated. Okay, you're giving him what you want, what he wants. Like the best possible response would to be like, okay, it's America. It's a free country. Make a product. If people like it, they buy it. If they don't, they don't. And you wasted a lot of money making shoes out of people's blood. Like, <laughs> All right. So before, before we get to our next caller, I do have a question from uh, Charismatic Catholic. I was told that your guest tonight may have possibly expressed some anti-Catholic sentiments. Oh. Just wondering if there was any veracity to the claim. If so, would he be willing to talk to a Catholic? Now, I don't think you, I, I didn't hear anything. Not intentionally, if that was the case. Um, no, I wasn't necessarily trying to make any anti-Catholic claims. Um, just trying to bring distinction between what Catholics believe about certain aspects of Christianity and other denominations believe about Christianity. Um, and with the larger point, I think that I was trying to make, which was that even within Christianity, people are disagreeing um, and that no one side has it all figured out. And we just kind of accept that as true, that no one denomination has all of the pieces figured out, which is why we're all trusting in Jesus to help us clear it out in the end. Um, no, I don't have anything against Catholicism at all. And I'd be happy to talk to some Catholics without a doubt. So, and uh, for the record, charismatic Catholic, definitely not to be confused with Catholic traditionalist. Very uh, good distinction because yes, they both had the. Had I was like, was that the, that doesn't sound like the same person? No, and no, no, it definitely wasn't. <laughs> if I'm remembering Catholic charismatic Catholic correctly, very very pleasant and polite dude. Um, I believe I've heard him on, I think it was either AXP or Talk Heathen. Speaking of Talk Heathen, uh, tomorrow is, every Tuesday, is my weekly call-in show called The Perspective, where we tackle supernatural and paranormal claims, belief in aliens, conspiracy theories, pretty much anything you want to get the skeptic's perspective on, call the show. And tomorrow's guest is none other than Eric Murphy from Talk Heathen. I'm fucking pumped to be co-hosting. There you go. Him. Um, but let's get to That's our exciting. next caller. I really appreciate everyone who called in tonight, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. So we have got uh, Glenn. You are on with Dan the Christian and Ethan the Atheist. How are you doing tonight, Dan? Good. How about you? Doing good. Or not Dan, Glenn. Sorry. Uh, doing well. But I'm doing uh, great too, Ethan. And thanks for asking. Appreciate it. <laughs> what, what do you got for us tonight, Glenn? Oh, sure. I wanted to ask Dan if he believes in the Big Bang and evolution and how that may relate to his religious beliefs. That's a good question. Um, I do believe in the Big Bang. Um, I do. Um, and evolution, I think, on a micro scale, uh, is not very difficult to accept. Um, I do think that on a more macro scale, um, it gets a little bit more difficult for me to accept uh, across the board. Um, but that's not to say that there aren't facets of the theory uh, that I think have merit and have value. And uh, yeah, I do believe in the Big Bang. So, so the Big Bang, uh, they say it was approximately 13.8 billion years ago. Um, it just seems to contradict the six to 10,000 year old views that a lot of religious folks have. Just wondering. Yeah, those are, so again, this comes down to the difference between people and Christianity. Um, you've got the young earth and the old earth tribes. Uh, I am not a young earth guy at all. Um, I, I just, I look at the science of dating how old the earth is. And I'm like, that makes sense. I get it. Uh, and I totally accept that. And I think within within my belief and understanding of Christianity and within scripture, um, I, I, I think there's room for that. I do. So, um, 
not every Christian agrees with me and that's okay. I don't know that it's a salvation issue, but um, yeah. And um, with regarding evolution, um, macro evolution, um, what about the story of Noah's Ark? Wouldn't there have to be like an accelerated evolution that would have taken place after Noah's Ark's story? Um, that's a good question. I, you know, to be honest, I don't know that I know enough about the specifics of all of that to dive into a really deep conversation around it. Um, but I would be more than happy to actually look at whatever stuff you're, you're referencing and, and have a deeper conversation about it another time. Um, yeah, again, like I said earlier, I'm not a, like, I'm not a big deep you know, apologist per se. So when it comes to diving into a lot of those specifics, um, I know enough to have a conversation only at a certain level. Um, and then I usually pause myself to say, let me see what you have. Let me look at it. Let me look at some sources that I know that I have that I, that I trust, um, and then continue the conversation. So, um, real quick, what Catholic, Ad sorry, Adam one second, Eve. Glenn. Uh, Adam and Eve compared to that we came from a common ancestor. Definitely. The Adam, the story of Adam and Eve, and in the Genesis account and all of that. Yeah, what, what about it? That yeah, compared to that we came from other apes. Yeah, no, that I mean that's that's at the core of macroevolution, and I'm I'm not necessarily on board with that. If that's what you're asking. Yeah, and you're familiar with like they figured out with the chromosomes that were they, they were one less chromosome. Yep, the other we're extremely eight. close it's when it comes to a biology and chromosome. Yeah, we're very very close. Absolutely. Yep. And they figured out we have one less chromosome, and then they they looked for it and figured out that two were fused together. So they predicted it ahead of time, and then they saw that those two were fused together, and it seems to be conclusive proof. Um, I'm happy to look at it, dude. Happy to look at it and read it. I, I mean, I'm not going to say yes or no one way or the other right here and now because I, I'm, I would like to dive into it a little bit more um, before I give that kind of a concrete answer. But um, yeah. we are on uh, limited other, other time, so Glenn, Sorry, we have time for interrupt. one more quick question. Okay, just wanted to ask uh, just about um. In the embryo, you can see the development. It's almost a an accelerated process of evolution. Um, you could an exaggerated process where you could see that we have web feet, um, web hands, a tail. Um, how could you explain that other than going through the evolutionary process? Pretty much. Um, I I would say, and again, this goes back to. Um, differences here and how we're looking at the same evidence, um, I would recognize a really, really amazing process um, that was designed like that's and it works great for every species on the planet. Um, that's that's how I would interpret that evidence. Um, but again, like I I would be more than happy to to look at anything that you're you're sent you'd be willing to send my way to try and help bring maybe a little bit more clarification to the points that you're trying to make so glenn okay. um, very nice to be able to do this um th there's a lot of atheist call-in shows but rarely do you get an opportunity like this so i appreciate it a lot no, yeah thank you and that's of that's course man thanks for you. thanks for calling in as you know uh bridge communication gaps you know uh Help us clear the confusion and, uh, you know, uh, build better. I I'm like, bleh, I'm losing my words right now. <laughs> build a community where we have better conversations with people, where we're not quick to just lash out and yell or insult, but trying to engage in honest, open, and friendly dialogue. So Catholic traditionalist, uh, if you would like to rephrase your question for Dan, uh, you know, I'd be happy to ask it, but you do need to show my uh, co-host the respect he deserves. Um, all right, let's get, uh, we're going to try and get through these uh, last two calls. Although a uh, Catholic traditionalist, I will happily leave a line open for you if you're willing to call the show. 
Um, okay, we have got Paul from Chicago. You are on with Dan and Ethan. How's it going? Hey, guys. Uh, and just uh, a big thumbs up from the show. I, I really like it. Uh, it's, it's actually really cool. Uh, I feel bad for Dan because all we've had is atheist callers, and I'm sure <laughs> maybe a Christian caller or something like that. But I don't know if Catholic is the guy you want calling in. <laughs> um, I, guess, I guess my, <laughs> um, I guess my question. Friendly is, fire, friendly fire. Uh, no. Um, anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, or less than friendly. Is, um, I, I'm sure that you're familiar with um, uh, Andrea Yates, uh, or maybe you're not. Uh, she was, I believe, in the '90s. She's a woman who um, who claimed that God told her to kill her children. Oh yeah. That I was like, I know the name from somewhere. I'm not super familiar with the details of the story, but I I know the general. Yeah, continue. Sorry, I forgot right, about that. I would suppose I would suppose that you wouldn't believe her, and you know, none of us here would believe her. Um, but for, as an atheist, you know, why wouldn't we believe her? Um, you know, I, I mean, or maybe as a Christian, you know, why wouldn't you believe her? You know, she's claiming she's talking to God. We can interview her. We have the testimony to talk to her. But when it comes about the, the claims of Jesus or, or about the resurrection or about anything really about his life, we don't really have a lot of information. And in, in many cases, we're, we're sort of going with information. Um, we don't even know if he actually said any of the things that he said. You know, we know that the, the writers of the Gospels are, are uh, supposedly all anonymous. So why would we trust Jesus or why would we trust what we think or what you think Jesus said over what this woman said? And as an atheist, how can we prove that she's wrong, I guess, is maybe my question. That's a great question. Um, I would say... Yeah, we all agree. Definitely wasn't talking to God. Um, and that's probably one of the crazy Christian Christian people who were hearing a voice in their head because they're mentally unstable and they're thinking well, it's God. Well, let's not let's not call anyone mentally unstable. Very good point. That's kind of a douchey phrase to yeah, put it that way. I, I, and, but. The concept there being someone who is clearly hearing voices in their head and probably needs some some help and some mental help um, and support and their theology and their their religious beliefs. Sadly, if they're not surrounded by the right kind of people to help correct them on stuff like that, they're going to feed off of certain aspects of their the religious belief as then justification for all of these weird voices and messages going on in their head. Ultimately, as a Christian, I look at all of that stuff and go, okay, is there anything in here that would contradict? And by in here, I say in, in scripture, specifically through the words of Jesus in the new Testament, is there anything that he has said, done, or taught that would be in direct contradiction to what this person is saying? They hear God telling them. There's a lot in scripture, especially after the New Testament and Jesus and the words that he said that contradict the idea that you should kill your children. Uh, like even the core yeah, story of Abraham and Isaac and all of that is a demonstration in the Old Testament of Jesus stepping or of God stepping in and saying, no, this is not OK, especially in an era and a time when most people, the gods that they were serving and worshiping, People didn't think twice about sacrificing a person to the God that they were worshiping, which is why to us that story sounds extremely awful. That, but then God goes, no, I don't want you to sacrifice your son. I'm going to bring in a lamb instead, and you should do that instead. Like, but There's a lot of theology crazy that I just threw out there for a lot of people. But Why, why, why? Why would a lamb be, um, you know, it's still, I mean, what if she, just, what, what if, I don't understand, like, even the difference here of, of a lamb, but, you know, like, we have mm. this sort of Bible where, you know, God tells people to go in and, and um, kill all the babies and, um, you know, kill all, all the Everything in the uh, the Old Testament, right? Yep. Yep. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. So, so, so why, why, 
Um, why couldn't we think that, uh, you know, God told whoever in this book um, to do that? Why, why do we believe something that was written 5,000 years ago, as opposed to this woman who claims the same exact thing that God told her this? I mean, right. I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm so, sorry. No, I get, dude, I, you're fired up about it too. And I, I can tell that. And that is totally okay. I, I get it. Um, the again for me, it comes back to the fact that Jesus changes everything, like seriously changes everything. Um, which is what that woman clearly oh, okay. wasn't getting. So Jesus changes everything, and no, and nobody has any more experience. Like God doesn't talk to anybody at this point. Like no, saying, I'm not. I'm not saying that. I'm saying the fact that this woman felt like she had to actually commit murder to please and obey God is is a concept that died on the cross and christians have never believed that ever because christianity started with jesus dying and raising from the dead so that that whole act of sacrificing another person or sacrificing an animal or you know whatever it is that whole act of jesus sacrificing himself on the cross was so that that was not something anybody had to even remotely consider as being a thing that was necessary anymore so that's never been something that christianity has believed that you gotta you know kill someone in order to um yeah so does that make sense i'm, I'm i feel like i'm i'm kind of getting yeah, I mean, my I mean, words I, broken I, up a little I, bit, but it I, sounds to me I, like, yeah, it seems to me like this lady clearly didn't understand the point of what Jesus was dying on the cross for in the first place. If she, the first thing she thinks when God is telling her to actually kill somebody, it's like that's not God. Like, if you're following Jesus and you're supposedly claiming to be a Christian, yeah, God's not in the business of killing and slaying or asking people to do that. So that's 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 not what He's doing. So, um, well, we have time for one more follow up question and then we got to get to our uh, next caller. Paul, go ahead. I, um, you know, I, I wanted to go to the next caller. I, I don't want to take up too much time, but it's just something I guess maybe just the, the thing to think about is, is again, is um, we're believing you, you're, you're saying that Jesus said this or Jesus did this. And again, we, we just don't really know if Jesus even said that. So we're kind of just taking it on faith that Jesus said that because we have these anonymous authors. And so we're we're taking anonymous authorship and, you know, something that we don't even know somebody said versus testimony that we have of one person. And yeah. that person we, we know, you know, and that, that's that's the only difference. There. But that, that's the only thing I wanted to, to add to that. Awesome. Well, uh, Paul, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for. Yeah. Thanks for calling in, man. I would, um, yeah, yeah. The only comes up on this show. Thank you. Yeah. I, I mean, the only thing there that I'd probably have a real strong disagreement on is the, um, the authors being completely, um, anonymous. I don't know that I, I think there's enough evidence to prove that the same person at least was the author of certain aspects of scripture. Now, what we call them was Paul actually called Paul. Was he called or was it? No, obviously the names and stuff are different, but there's, I don't want to get into a big old debate right now, but <laughs> I, I don't think I'm there's sure we can go back and forth, but to conclude, you know, that I, I to me, from my understanding, uh, is the, these are to the best of our ability anonymous and we don't know who specifically wrote them or if they were written by the same person. Uh, but Paul, uh, thank you so much. Thanks for calling okay. in, man. Appreciate it. Okay, let's get to, I, I really, this has been, like, I feel bad. We had any was, Christians call in to give you a hard time yet? I don't think I know, so. And the I, only one that seems to be, like, really out there and chiming in is one that wants to give me a hard time. So, yes, I'm kind of like, <laughs> what's so, going on here? Not only are um, atheists giving you a hard time, but Christians are too. I'm used to oh. it. Whatever. <laughs> it's fine. Um, The reason, and just... I don't even know if he's still watching, but just to clarify, I am seeing your question and the question is entirely centered around politics. It's not centered around the gospel. So if you as a Christian want to try and start criticizing my understanding of the gospel and my understanding of what it means to follow Jesus, then use scripture. Don't use politics to do it. 
So I'll if, I do want to ask before we get to, uh, he did rephrase his question. So yes. thank you, CT. That yeah. is a much more kind and polite and appreciated way of phrasing this. I appreciate yeah. that. Did you vote for Biden? And are you a leftist? Um, I voted down the line entirely Republican on my last election, except for Donald Trump. I did not vote for Donald Trump at all. I voted for all Republicans on the ticket or Libertarian. More mm. often than not, I voted Libertarian and uh, if the option was there. Um, and then I voted for Joe Biden. I did. Okay, cool. Let's get to... Uh, so I don't know. Does that make me a leftist? I, I voted I, for I most... I voted for conservatives up and down the ticket, except for Donald Trump. So I don't know. That might break his brain a little bit, but yeah, that's. Um, I I would have thought you actually voted left all the way down. Um. Anyways, let's quickly no, get to these no, last no. calls. Uh, because this is going way I, long. I, I I should clarify, for our local school board, I did vote Democrat. That was okay. what one person that was on there. Ballot. Thank you for being uh, transparent. Um, transparent. All right. yeah. We have got charismatic Catholic interested in discussing Catholicism with Dan. Okay, cool. How's it going? Hey, guys. How's it going? Good. How are you? Great. I'm doing all right. Doing all right. Um, yeah, just uh, just calling in to, I guess, talk to, uh, talk to Dan about... Uh, um, about Catholicism. I know you had uh, you had mentioned earlier you'd be willing to, to talk with a Catholic on the phone. So, sure, we yeah, are we'll do, um, we are very limited on time, but uh, so we'll try try and keep it as brief as possible. But yeah, go ahead. Okay, um, I guess I'll just I'll just ask what ask a single question, uh, Dan. Would you uh, I, I, not knowing what denomination you are? I mean. Uh, I'm just going to ask, would you hold to uh, the doctrine of Sola Scriptura? Clarify. What I'm, I guess I'm not familiar. Is that a, do you want to explain more of exactly what, what it is that you mean by that? Uh, the doctrine of Sola Scriptura? Um, sure. It's, so for most, pro, for, for most Protestants, um, for most denominations of Protestants, they're going to, they're going to hold to this theological doctrine uh, that posits that, um, that, that, that the scripture, that Christian scripture is, um, is all that is sufficient. Um, sorry, is all that is sufficient as a source of authority when it comes to Christianity. You only need the Bible. Um, that's like the, I guess the, the, the broad stroke of what sola scripture okay. is. Okay. Gotcha. Yep. Would you I, I, I know, I, Definitely know what you're talking about now. I the terminology of it is the 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 phrasing the phraseology of that is I was not familiar with, but um, uh, yeah, scripture is absolutely the the um filter by which every every believer needs to be living their life. Yeah, so um, yeah. So would, you, would you say that it's it's the sole? Would you go as so far as to say that it is it is the sole source of authority? As in, you do not need, um, you know, you do not need uh, an exterior source, something like, um, you know, like a uh, pastor, pope, priest, or denomination of, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, all of that stuff. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now. Now, a corollary of that doctrine, though, is that the Bible's teachings then are going to be clear to all Christians. So if if the Bible's teachings are going to be clear to all Christians because Scripture is their sole source of authority, then in theory, wouldn't you say that, you know, all Protestant groups, you know, whether it's Baptist, whether it's uh, Methodist, whether, you know, whatever, whatever mm -hmm. you, know, you want to come up with, all, pro all Protestant groups then... Um, in theory, since they're drawing from this sole source of scripture, mm -hmm. they should be they should be coming to uh, they they shouldn't have any disagreements when it comes to doctrine. You get what I'm you get what I'm kind of getting I, at. I totally get where you're coming at, and I see where you're going with that. Um, my my answer, my explanation would kind of link back to what I was saying earlier in the show when it comes to um, sanctification. 
um, the idea that, um, so I f forget what the phrase is, the, the way that you phrased it. Um, the, oh, um, the, sorry, what was that? Uh, sola Scriptura. Right. So the idea that, well, you were basically trying to say that, um, that all, like, the understanding of Scripture is understood equally by everybody when you become a Christian. Is that kind of what you were saying? I'm trying to not put words in your mouth yeah, here. Yeah, the understanding of it. So the understanding of it would be clear in a way that there could be no there could be no differing interpretations. Of that's it. right. Okay. So, so that right there, I think that, so that's again, um, when you accept, when you say yes to following Jesus, at least from the Protestant perspective, um, that means that you are starting to understand scripture. You're starting to understand the words of God. Um, but you don't just magically have everything in the Bible be abundantly clear completely right away. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that scripture isn't still the, the, the final authority or the final filter or scripture uh, is obviously the thing that guides all of that. Um, but you don't just magically have the ability to understand all of it from cover to cover clearly. Um, because of the, uh, like I said earlier, the sanctification process, like everybody is on this journey, everybody's on this spiritual process of being shaped more and more and more into the character and likeness uh, of who God is and representing Jesus to the world as an ambassador. Um, and so as such, everybody's got their own crap they got to deal with. Uh, and God's working on everybody in their own pace, in their own areas. Uh, to the extent that they allow him to as well. And this is where the whole relationship thing comes in. But um, I don't know if that answers your question at all, but that would be my my understanding or my explanation of why some of this stuff isn't just, oh, well, all these Christians just instantly have clarity on all of this stuff right away. And everybody's on the same page. Um, that's That would be my explanation yeah yeah I guess, so. I guess, it sounds like you're it sounds like you're you're acknowledging at least that whether it's because people maybe are on a different um uh, maybe they're at a different position they're at a different point uh on this you know on their their christian faith um you're saying like if i understand you correctly because they may be at a different point than somebody else their interpretation may be different and you don't see a problem with that is that kind of yeah i mean it, yeah it's yeah like it okay there's and, and and this is where like understanding that scripture ultimately is the ultimate authority above anybody else like if we understand scripture is saying something specific and then we start following somebody or a particular denomination or a particular oh i don't know political party like the gop who starts propping themselves up as a wing of christianity and they're doing the exact opposite of what jesus is teaching um a jesus that is obviously not white as some of you guys are making these ridiculous assertions in the chats about um the well, uh still think jesus is white no, God, no. The guy was Arabic. Are you kidding me? Who the... <laughs> Why is this still a thing? Why is this still a thing? Why... Because you Republicans? Uh... <laughs> okay. The um... fact that I didn't vote for Donald Trump doesn't make me a Democrat. The fact that I did vote for Joe Biden and wrote and, and, and didn't vote for Democrat all the way down the line does not mean I'm a Republican either. God, how many times do we have to go over this? Good Lord. All right. Catholic, anyway. Catholic I'm so, going to give you uh, one yeah. follow-up. Uh, that was a total I, rabbit I, trail. I apologize. That was ridiculous. But. Let you both no, keep no, talking, but uh, we're yeah, we're way over time. We still have one more call. So please. I, I uh, got you. I, go. I got you. I'll just, uh, let, let me just end with this. I would say that for you had mentioned, uh, Dan, um, that uh, for you, so you're saying ultimately for you, scripture is the ultimate source of authority and you wouldn't appeal to some external force. I would just say that as a Catholic, uh, we are, we know that the Catholic church, 
that it teaches that it receives um, inspired text from God through human authors, and that the church is that that God is guiding the church into discerning, uh, you know, what among the text is is truly inspired. And because of this, we will not have we cannot have schism. Where is because a Protestant, someone in your position who is looking only at Scripture as their ultimate source of authority. They are left in a position where they will be part of a group that is uh, appealing to millions of individual interpretations of what. Mm-hmm. Um, and for me, that for me, that's a big problem. So I gotcha. got to I see. I I that was Thanks. very very good and clarifying distinction, and I very much understand even like theologically and practically. I get where you're coming from there. I I totally understand that. So. Um, and we can disagree and not be disagreeable, which is totally fine. So thank you so much for the, the call, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. And charismatic Catholic, you've always yes, been a very you. sweet dude. I, I appreciate your, your, uh, always being polite. I've heard you call into other shows and, uh, I just want to thank you for being a courteous and friendly person. I appreciate it. Ethan. Thank you. Definitely. Have a good one. Bye-bye. All right, before we get to our last call, which we'll get to as quickly as possible, I would like to... Holy crap, Caitlin! Oh, what? Wow, like, thank you. Love, love, love the show. And Dan may now be my favorite Christian. Um, Thank you for Super Chat. For those that don't know, Caitlin's our call screener, too. So, and one of our moderators and has been doing so much behind the scenes for the community. So, Caitlin, thank you. Um, Godless blessings. Thanks to the crew and mods. Yes, the crew and mods are incredibly helpful and relieve in a great deal of stress from my back. Like I originally, Dan, didn't have a call screener tonight. It's There's just so many things that go into this that sometimes you forget things. And Caitlin's like, do you need a call screener tonight? And I was like, oh my God, I don't have a call screener. So right. yes, thank you, Caitlin, for jumping Very on cool. it last minute and reminding me that I needed one. Um, Okay, so uh, we're going to get to Nathaniel. We will have to make this as quick as possible. But hey, Nathaniel, you're on with Dan and Ethan. How's it going? Hello. (laughs) Sorry, there's road noise. I'm driving. Uh, (laughs) I like this guy already. This is Uh, awesome. That was weird. No. So I have like a million things to say about the the, the, the Catholic conversation, but I'm not going to. Well, Mr. Catholic guy, you and I are going to chat. Um. (laughs) Dan, how are you? We've never met, and that makes me sad. But you were I like talking. you already. I've known you for all of ten seconds, and I yeah, uh... Dan, you were. Do you remember Star Wars trivia, Susan? Uh, Susan yes. is Nathaniel's partner. Oh, all right, all right. Yeah. So, uh, what do you want for us? so I will make it super. I'll make it super duper quick. It actually became like two questions that are kind of the same but anyways uh i was listening to you dan and i I can kind of see where you're at i was an evangelical for a long time as well and so i kind of understand why you're saying some of the things too it makes sense to me um but so we have the in the the new testament of the 27 books um which are all written you know in greek obviously you know that 13 of those are purported to have been written by the apostle paul the overwhelming majority of scholars critical and Christian mm. would say that really only six of them were actually written by Paul. And okay. I would like, based on like some of the answers I've heard you give tonight, your, your thoughts on that. My, my thoughts on, um, on them actually being only six of them for sure being written by Paul. Yeah, and some of them certainly not. Like Second Thessalonians, absolutely not written by Paul. Like not being written by Paul. Um, what is the so? What is the the uh, the the prevailing theory then? If it wasn't written by him, it was written by nobody, or it was written by like a person who was a note taker with him or something, or I'm just. Sorry, I must have been talking over. Yeah, Second Thessalonians would have been written. I don't know, close to the end of the first century, we can tell that because it doesn't have any apocalyptic type stuff inside of it that Paul yeah. had in the first Thessalonians. Mm-hmm. Um, it certainly removes women from the church altogether. And instead of Jesus coming back, it's more of putting the church together, you know, like a, a 
establish like a hierarchy and stuff like that. It's the exact opposite of First Thessalonians. You're right. Okay. Uh, but like, like just like hearing that, like in in Paul wrote First and Second Corinthians, and in First Corinthians chapter fifteen, right, the the, the creed that he writes, mm-hmm. um, and in he, and he says. You know, that Jesus died according to the scriptures. Obviously, he's quoting Hosea chapter 6 right there. But he said that first he appeared to Cephas, and then he appeared to the Mm twelve. Right? Who are the twelve? Well, the twelve there would be, um, I forget, who, who was it that took Judas's place? Well, yeah, it's Matthias, but Matthias didn't take Judas's place. And that technically, I was going to, I was going to say, actually, no, that wouldn't have been him because that was after the upper room, which was before. Uh, yeah, no, I see where you're going, dude. I see where you're going there. Yeah. So what? So you're so the overall question that you were trying to ask, though, it seemed like was about just my thoughts on on. Yeah. Well, because Paul wrote. Yeah, I, sorry. I wanted to give an example of what we know Paul wrote. Gotcha. Okay. Which is in like First Corinthians, which of course shows some like later embellishment to the Gospels, but that's not really important. Yeah. Uh, but then, as opposed to what they would, what the overwhelming majority of New Testament scholars would say, those seven books, uh, like Ephesians and Colossians and those and, and, and Second Thessalonians, were just not written by Paul. Mm-hmm. And I wonder what you think about that. Um, are you, are you trying to, in a very, very kind and gentle way, ask me if whether or not that, that brings a level of uncertainty, if he didn't write all of those into me believing them or accepting them on the same level as the other books? Is that kind of where you're going with that? Or no, 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 (laughs) you just, it is Uh, a, ask anything. You're just curious what I'm thinking. Yeah. Uh, well, no, they're polemics in first and second seventy. But yeah. uh but they don't it doesn't change the veracity of what they're trying to say. And absolutely right. not. Right. I can understand yeah. that completely. And by the way, yes, Jesus did exist for everybody that's out there. And y'all 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 crazy can I say he didn't. Thank um, you. Say he didn't, but, <laughs> uh, but but I wonder if if you research that, so that's that actually is a good question, and I'm sorry I'm taking more time than I wanted to. It's okay. But it's more my fault for asking I, I more and more clarifying questions. So <laughs> that's all on me. I, I have always, Susan and I were talking about this this morning, actually. We have, we have made quite a few like uh, uh, videos about like, you know, things that we see like in the Bible and stuff, you know, and one of those has to do with like the birth of Jesus and stuff. And we said, you know that Jesus could have been born in Nazareth or Bethlehem or like anywhere else on the planet. And it wouldn't change the fact that he might've come back from the dead. Uh, so even if there is like a mistake somewhere, it doesn't mean that the entire story is wrong, right? Uh, I see where you're going there. And I wonder yep. if you found out, if you found out, like, and you and you accepted that Paul simply did not write these seven books, or maybe he wrote Colossians and now it went seven to six. To me, it's a you know jump ball in Zach of Baylor, right? Right. Uh, would, that, would that ever change anything as far as for you, like, not your faith? But as far as like, well, how do I, how can I know who wrote these things then? I mean, I think, I think there's, if we're looking at the historical collection of how all of these books were written, how they were transcribed, and even the fascinating story of how they got put together into one massive book called the Bible, um, any Christians that are out there who haven't spent time actually diving into all of that for themselves, um, do that, <laughs> do that. Um, cause I think I, I really like your question and I really like the conversation that you're having here, which, which is an interesting, it, I, I love it because it's being real about the authenticity of scripture. Um, which is a real big thing for Christians. And I think the overall authenticity of scripture, regardless of whether or not 
Second Thessalonians was written by Paul officially, if we could find verifiable truth that it wasn't. Um, okay. But from the Christian perspective, does that mean that it then suddenly loses its authenticity as its authority of scripture? For me, I, I don't know that that would be the case. I'm sure Christians, if that type of bomb were to get dropped in the middle of our world, there would be people on both sides who would be arguing that for the rest of eternity. Um, but the core of the message of what Christianity is about, I don't know that it would change it very much, uh, if at all, to be honest. So, um, no, I agree with you. Um, I, I'm happy that you said that too, because I think it's what needs to happen. I don't, I don't necessarily disagree. I think there's a lot of really, really, really deep and honest and reflective conversations that Christianity needs to be having amongst itself. Um, I think there's a lot of research and studies are being done um, by like Barna Research Group uh, as one that's excellent, that is doing statistical analysis and surveying of the church in the United States. There's a lot of Christians that are absolutely clueless on what is actually in the Bible themselves. Um, that's not a, a good lot thing. Of atheists too. Yeah, and a lot of atheists. Yeah, that's very true. Um, I'm yeah, more used to going at more. Hey, the majority of atheists don't know a goddamn thing about the Bible. <laughs> he said it. He said it. Not, yeah. I'll be, I, I, uh, don't, I am biblically, not biblically illiterate, but biblically stupid. But. <laughs> So it was actually the very first name of the first episode on my show was Biblically Illiterate Christians. Uh, really? If you want to go back into the archives of the Dear Christians podcast, uh, you can take a listen to that. It's a good one. Um, we are way over in the time, Nathaniel. So one more minute. <laughs> anything you want to wrap Sorry. up with? No, 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 no. I just, uh, no, I just wanted to ask him that question there because there's some things that, you know, I've been, I was listening to like, because some of the uh, uh, responses that were given there that you had, um, which I could critique to next week. You want to like write down my name and number, please feel free to call me. Um, uh, <laughs> a lot, I heard that some of that, like that it came out of uh, some, let's just call it pseudepigraphical writings in, in the New Testament. And I just wanted to call you and, and, uh, and see what you thought. See what I thought. Well, there you go. There you go. I, there's there's a lot of good comments being made. I know Blaine mentioned it. he's a great he made a great comment there. I don't know if you want to if you see that one, Ethan. If you want to bring that up real quick, where he said um, if a part of the Bible becomes suspect, wouldn't it the whole thing be um, thrown into very serious question? How would you determine what is and isn't genuine? Um, that's again, going back to a conversation of differences between different aspects of Christianity and how the whole Bible was put together in the first place. The Catholic Bible has books in it that Protestant Bibles do not. Um, and that's because of very, very strong differences that they have between the two of them on what books are or are not, uh, divinely inspired and written and the justifications for them. Um, for me, I look at that and I go, okay, amongst all of those people within Christianity that disagree, here's the ones that they all agree on. And I'll kind of try and focus and stick my attention there um, is, is the practical logic behind um, my thought process there. But um, it is a very good point. It is a very good question. And it is something that I think Christians need to be more well-versed in to be able to have that conversation in an educated way so no, i wish i wish that we had more time because i could answer it me too <laughs> I, i'm I, sure you I, could yeah um anyway uh nathaniel thank you so much uh, for calling in it was uh, it was nice chatting with you and tell susan i said hi hi ethan hi dan hi susan hi <laughs> i've been here the whole time yeah she's been here she's been here the whole time so but hey this is supposed to be one person so calling in, not two <laughs> Thanks, Daniel. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Drive safe. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Bye bye. Bye. Um, it stinks. Catholic traditionalists just tried to call in, but I suspended new lines because obviously we're at like two hours and ten. We're minutes. over two hours already, dude. Yeah. yeah. I was not expecting this, so 
Um, to the viewers watching, uh, let me know what you thought. Reach out to me on Twitter or, or Facebook. I could use the feedback. Would you like to see something like this again? Or would you like to see the same show again as a, as a, weekly, uh, as a weekly podcast? Um, did you enjoy Dan? Which I think most people did. Dan, I, I felt like you were in the hot seat. The oh, I was, <laughs> I was like absolutely in the hot seat, like, dude. I, I was just like the 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 mediator in a sense. Like just I was, I was the on. ant. I was the ant, and your show was the microscope, or the magnifying <laughs> glass, and the whole of the internet was the sun. Just. <laughs> burning me and, and hope, no, even I'm the christians kidding. they I'm, didn't want to talk to me they wanted to they talk wanted to talk to me <laughs> what is that all about like, i thought the whole reason stuff. why this show exists i think is because you just wanted to have a break really you wanted to just <laughs> sit here and watch a christian just just get the just get roasted i i think it was no i'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> no never if if I, <laughs> that's the thing i I like, for instance, when I did the round table with the Republicans, you'll see that as the weeks went on, I kept looking for new Republicans because I never want to misrepresent people. I don't want to go for wins or put myself in a situation just where I look like I'm smarter. Like, I don't care if I, if it, if it hasn't apparent now by now, I don't care if I look dumb. I am learning as I go, and I always want to represent the opposition as best as possible. There are enough people out there straw manning each other and not having the conversations that need to happen. I don't want to contribute to that. I would like to represent Christianity as best as possible. And therefore I turn to a knowledgeable guest who I will say there is one, one sticking point for me is I, I don't want to bring on somebody that has necessarily harmful views. Um, which, you know, are, you know, I guess, uh, I guess it depends how you define harmful, but you know, I, I should say extreme views. I don't want to platform any extremists. Like I want to make sure we're having these, uh, good conversations. Uh, Godless Blessing says Dan was great with Ethan. Uh, yeah, hopefully if there's a next time we get more callers to, to ch challenge me. Um, anyways, uh, Dan, what do you have going on? Um, Lots of amazing stuff, actually. Um, I actually just launched a Patreon page today, um, which is exciting. Um, and that particular community, I'm hoping, becomes uh, a, a place for us to have open and honest conversations amongst people who understand and support the purpose of the show. Um, I, I, had a, I have a Facebook group, I've got a YouTube channel, all that stuff, but I felt like a lot of that seemed to be a breeding ground for just trolls who were not even remotely invested in actually demonstrating genuine, honest, and respectful conversations amongst people who believe differently. So um, hopefully my Patreon page can be a place where that is actually thriving. Um, you can get a t-shirt or a sticker. Um, and uh, I've got an episode coming out, um, actually a live broadcast we're gonna be doing this Sunday at two o'clock with uh, a pastor uh, from Chinook, Kansas. And we're gonna be discussing why pastors are quitting, why people are leaving the profession of um, pastoral care uh, right now. And uh, then I got another conversation that is in the editing queue right now about marijuana and the legalization of marijuana, which would be a really good conversation. Okay. I swear to God, you better yep. be in support of the legalization. You're all like fired up about that. I'm going to drop that little teaser and let you just I... listen to the episode when it comes out. Um, and then, uh, like I said earlier in the show, we've got a conversation about purity culture coming up. Um, all of this, all of this is just at the website, uh, dearchristianspodcast.com. So you can send your thanks, your support, your hate mail, whatever. <laughs> Dan uh, all, all there. So um, I would like to uh, Epoch's Knowledge says CT, Catholic traditionalist, if you're trying to get allies and people who vote along with you, I promise you this isn't the way to do it. And this isn't the place to do it. But keep it up. You're doing uh, my work for me. That's true. <laughs> Cat people like Catholic traditionalists and dark doctors. They do more for atheism than, than you could imagine because 
when you hear these people and how they talk to others, nobody should treat other people like that or mm. talk to other people like that. Like, especially if you want to gauge in honest and open dialogue, like, yeah, the whole point and we can, thing is just I'm, bullshit. Again, I, I'm, I'm happy to, it. I'm happy to have the conversation with them maybe on another another broadcast um i would say this most of it seems to be centered around the support or opposition uh surrounding the issue of abortion which go to my episodes on leaving the gop for jesus okay In, i gotta hear that leaving did you for jesus. do you not listen to these episodes i put out yet ethan it's uh, a I, I two-parter <laughs> and there is a christian who has Spent his life working for the GOP and left not only a career in politics, but left the Republican Party altogether because he felt he was not able to follow Jesus and do so without sacrificing his integrity as a follower of Jesus. Um, and he's got some really interesting insights into how the Republican Party is actually manipulating the evangelical community to buy their loyalty by having a political football known as abortion and pro-life that has never actually changed because they don't want to actually change the law because they want that issue there to convince people to go to the polls and continue to vote for them and give them power. That was a lot. It gets broken down in a lot better detail uh, on my show. So I would encourage everybody to go listen to that. It's a really good conversation. So and the link is in the description. Also, I would like to thank, ah, uh, crap. I got to pull up the updated list of patrons. Real there quick. you go. If you like what I do, consider becoming a patron for as low as $1 a month. Um, I would like to thank my current top tier patrons, Cindy Plaza, Kenneth Leonard, Kathy Leto, Jump and Shoot, Oz, Secular Rarity, Kianta, and Fava Beans. Philip Leach, Caitlin Beyond, Toast, Richard Gilliver, uh, uh, and Sunset Sarge. All of you are awesome, and I appreciate your patronage. It is all of you people that are going to be the reason that one day I can do this full-time and put all my time and energy into building a community and building a bigger channel and normalizing and bringing more attention to atheism and atheist movement and how to have these and helping to have these better conversations. So Dan, I'm sorry. I didn't get to challenge you more. I really did actually want to, but I, I, I feel like right. it you're so disappointed yeah. into me and you talking and I didn't want to take away from the callers. So I, that's Dan, that you're being a good host. That's okay. That's thank good. you for being a, a, a great guest and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, oh, I did. Wait. <laughs> I did. I did. I'm sorry. I was reading. Uh, I was reading something. Okay. I'll. I'll. Ex I'll happily extend uh, an invite to Darth Dawkins for a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, I would prefer it privately, though. And as I'll opposed pray to for both just of you. As, Good Lord. Um, uh, unless, I, I, as long as he's friendly. Like I just. I, I know I was a little abrasive with him last time. Uh, you know, even I have my less than friendly moments. I'm not perfect. I try to be as friendly as possible, but there are times where I get heated and I'm just like, especially when I hear the way certain people talk to others, it's like, j just don't talk to people like that. I get really frustrated. Can I, can I drop a little thing on that for our friend Darth Dawkins and all of these Catholic traditionalists and all of that? Please. Biblical intellect is not a fruit of the spirit. I don't They're know intelligent. What I know you don't, but they do. Spiritual intellect, biblical insight is not a fruit of the spirit. And you can know as much as you want about what's in the Bible and shove it in people's faces and cram it down their throats all day long and do it without exercising any of the fruits of the spirit. So think about that. Anyways. Thank you. Until um, next time. <laughs> until next time, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, like, subscribe, all the good stuff. Dan, once again, thank you. Uh, everyone be safe. And we'll be back tomorrow with The Perspective with uh, Eric Murphy, uh, where we tackle supernatural, paranormal claims, belief in aliens, all the good stuff. So have a good night, everyone.
You guys are still here? It's over. Go home. <laughs>